welcome one and all to Patreon Request Month on Escape from Vault Disney, the podcast where we review movies, TV shows, and short films available on Disney Plus, chosen mostly completely at random. And this week, the randomizer has truly blessed us with our first ever Simpsons episode. We're all familiar with The Simpsons, obviously. Oh, yes. We've heard of it, right? Is that the As one somebody the who had been following the podcast Escape from Vault Disney since it began, and its host Tony Goldmark for several years before that, I was eagerly anticipating the randomizer finally landing on The Simpsons. The Simpsons is a major pop culture touchstone, and it would have a major impact on much of the television landscape throughout the 1990s and well into the new millennium. It upended preconceived notions of what could be discussed and explored through the medium of television through its, for the time, subversive characters, crass humor, and meaningful depictions of human emotion which showed that even something crass can carry simple but powerful meaning. It was because of all of this and more that The Simpsons has won countless awards and accolades over the more than 30 years it's been on our TV screens. But I was personally looking forward to EFVD finally getting a Simpsons episode for much the same reason that many other listeners, as well as Goldmark himself and his guests were. I grew up with The Simpsons. My dad introduced it to me when I was a small child, probably only an infant given that I was born only a few days after the season 6 episode A Star as Burns had aired. It has consistently been the one thing we share and bond over most, even during times of tumultuous external strife. When my family moved from Philly to Florida when I was a kid, The Simpsons was one of the few constants I still had from my old life, thanks in part to my dad's season 2 box set that he'd never watched on his own. As I grew older, I began to appreciate the show on a deeper level than just its comedy. Episodes like Lisa's Substitute and Bart Gets an F resonated with me on a deeper emotional level than I could really interpret when I was a kid. I began listening to the commentary tracks included with every single episode in the DVD box sets, and learning about the people who made the show. I've been so entrenched in The Simpsons for basically my whole life that in my Halo 4 video I accidentally misnamed Sergeant Johnson's voice actor, David Scully, as Mike Scully, one of the many writers of The Simpsons' Golden Age who ran the show from 1997 to 2001. The Simpsons finally got its due on EFVD during Patreon Request Month in September 2021. I personally requested The Simpsons movie along with a few other patrons, mainly for personal reasons which I won't air out here. The randomizer didn't select the movie, but it did select a classic episode which I've always found to be endlessly fascinating, an episode which has, for decades, persisted among the upper echelons of many fans' all-time favorite episodes. Season 4, Episode 17, Last Exit to Springfield. I don't dislike this episode. Far from it, in fact. I absolutely adore it. But ever since I heard this episode of Escape from Vault Disney, I started to think about it more than I had before. Perhaps it was the hour's worth of anecdotes, insight, and personal commentary provided by Goldmark and his guests, most of whom were Simpsons superfans themselves. But I started watching this episode fairly regularly afterwards. Not an insane amount, a few times a week at most. But I wanted to finally figure out exactly what it was about this specific episode that intrigued me so. The anecdotes and personal commentary from the EFVD episode had started to set me on the right path, but I knew there had to be more to it. After months of watching and rewatching this episode, ruminating on the plot, the characters, the jokes, every scene, every shot, every line, every gag, I finally figured out what makes Last Exit to Springfield so damn good. It's not any one element that makes it brilliant. It's everything. Together. Oh! For the few watching who maybe haven't seen this episode, it isn't terribly complicated to follow. The power plant's workers' union contract is up for renegotiation, and Mr. Burns offers a free keg of beer at their union meetings in exchange for the workers giving up their dental plan. Homer speaks out against the new proposed contract because otherwise he would have to pay out of pocket for Lisa to get her braces. He's then made the new union president and subjected to a bevy of hardball negotiating tactics from Mr. Burns, but Homer's sheer ineptitude during these negotiations is misinterpreted by Burns as hyper-competency. 
With negotiations at a standstill, the workers go on strike, which pushes Burns to cut power to the entire town in an effort to demoralize the workers, but ultimately gives in to their demands when it doesn't work, as long as Homer steps down from the position of head of the union. Great episode, go watch it on Disney+. Plus. Unlike most episodes of the show, Last Exit to Springfield doesn't open with a first act that's only a tangentially related setup for the main plot. It doesn't really have a B-plot either. Sure, the episode cuts back to Lisa being miserable with her comically designed headgear, but such scenes aren't present to have some sort of story or arc with Lisa, but rather to reinforce Homer's story and remind the audience of what it is that's at stake. At its core, Last Exit to Springfield is an episode about the common man, blue-collar workers, fighting for their rights against the system that values money over the well-being of their fellow man. And just about every aspect of this episode supports this theme or otherwise is rooted in these characters and these circumstances, even the jokes and gags. In his book, Springfield Confidential, Mike Reese, who has been a writer on the show since the very first season, and co-ran the show alongside Al Jean when this episode was produced, goes into great detail about the process of producing an episode of The Simpsons. He also discusses some of the more unique aspects of the creative process behind the show, from the egregious number of rewrites to his own personal belief when it comes to writing comedy. Quote, No matter what the setup, there's always a perfect joke for it. It may not be a great joke, but it's always the right joke for the moment. It's there in the universe, waiting to be discovered. Unquote. Last Exit to Springfield may not have been written by Reese. It was co-written by Jay Kogan and Wallace Waladarski, but it was produced during his tenure running the show with Al Jean, during which both of them were also a part of the writer's room, which constantly rewrote and reworked every script that came through that wasn't written by John Swartzwelder. This episode is brimming with jokes, gags, and clever writing in service to its themes. From the episode's opening sequence, we clearly establish who the villain is and why. McBain is a series of movies within the Simpsons universe which normally serves as a vehicle to parody big-budget Hollywood action movies and 80s action heroes, Arnold Schwarzenegger in particular, through McBain himself, played by the character Rainier Wolfcastle. The villain of the movie, Senator Mendoza, revels in human misery, which is so cartoonish in its flagrant cruelty that the Republican Party is probably taking notes as we speak. We pull back to see that Homer and Bart are watching the movie on TV, and Homer reassures his son that nobody is actually that evil in real life, then smash cut to Mr. Burns laughing maniacally at his window washer clinging for dear life outside his office building before closing the curtains, allowing the window washer to fall to his death, and then proceeding to plot to take away his workers' dental coverage in order to save money. It doesn't take somebody with a bachelor's degree in film to explain why this sequence works as well as it does, but I'll do it real quick anyway in case you missed it. It's funny, swift, has immaculate timing, and establishes what the foundation for this episode's conflict is going to be. It also establishes in a matter of seconds why the plant's union leader is unavailable, through a joke about Jimmy Hoffa. What the hell? And through a flashback stuffed with even more jokes, offers a hyper-abridged history of the struggle between workers and management, while communicating why workers' unions are needed in the first place to protect the workers, who are the ones who actually generate capital and their interests. You can't treat the working man this way. One day we'll form a union and get the fair and equitable treatment we deserve. Then we'll go too far and get corrupt and shiftless. And the Japanese will eat us alive. The Japanese? Those sandal-wearing goldfish tenders? <laughs> Bosh! Flimsha! This conflict between workers and management continues to be represented throughout the episode. Take, for example, the wrestling promo Homer sees on TV. It's for a death match between Dr. Hillbilly, who's dressed like a low-income blue-collar worker, and the Iron Yuppie, who wears a suit and tie while carrying a briefcase, evoking the image of bureaucrats and management types who typically just want as much money as possible, the well-being of their workers like Dr. Hillbilly be damned. It's a total non-sequitur, you could cut it out of the episode and nothing fundamentally changes, but it does reflect the episode's themes and positions Homer on the side of the working class when he says, I hope they kill that Iron Yuppie. He's so big. In fact, all of the jokes, gags, non sequiturs, and cutaways in this episode are tethered to what is actually going on or being discussed in the particular scene they spawn from. Hell, even the title of the episode is a reference to the Hubert Selby Jr. novel Last Exit to Brooklyn, 
which features a subplot about a union representative who becomes corrupt. Remember that this was a time before DVDs and the like, so viewers wouldn't actually know the titles of these shows. This was just an in-joke among the show's writing staff, an esoteric one, but one that helps to support what the show's trying to do. One type of joke that The Simpsons frequently dealt with in the 90s was cutaway gags, but after Family Guy hit the airwaves in the late 90s and reduced cutaways to being almost entirely fluff with little to no natural relationship to what's happening in the show and caught flack for doing so, The Simpsons eased up on cutaways almost completely. So not only is it refreshing to revisit this episode and see cutaways on the show at all, but it's gratifying seeing them naturally spawn from the scenario, like with Homer's flashback to the Strike of 88, or Lisa's laughing gas-induced hallucinogenic trip involving these Liverpool lads in their <coughs> purple submersible. Look out for the campy drawing of Queen Victoria! Oh, oh, no. oh, oh God, help, help us. us. Help us. Help it us. It was just so nice and kind of peaceful. I know we were earlier making the comparison to Family Guy cutaway gags. Right. A Family Guy cutaway gag always feels very in your face. Yeah. Whereas this just feels nice and fun. It doesn't feel <laughs> jarring or disjointed. Like, I really enjoy how they transition in and out of them because it Absolutely. felt like it added to the episode rather than just being like, a, oh, you just needed an excuse to make this one joke. <laughs> okay, well, Lisa's going to be on laughing gas. Let's do a sequence where she's tripping. Family Guy's version of this would have been Peter's at the gas station or something like, oh man, this is worse than that time I found myself in that concept album. And then <laughs> they wouldn't even go for like the Lisa in the sky thing. You think that's bad? Uh but in order for there to be conflict in any story, there have to be opposing forces to conflict. Mr. Burns is straightforward enough and doesn't require much dissection. In fact, my breakdown of the opening couple of minutes outlines his role in the episode quite well. But Homer requires a bit more exploration. People who haven't watched much of The Simpsons or have only watched episodes from more recent seasons may see Homer as a bit of an impulsive jerk with anger issues. The name Jerkass Homer used to describe the flanderization of his character post-Golden Age is ubiquitous, even to the show's current writing staff. But Homer Simpson wasn't always quite like that. In the Golden Age, Homer was a more outwardly caring father, and while he did still have anger issues and an impulsive streak, rarely was he willfully neglectful or outwardly malicious. Notorious recluse and acclaimed Simpsons writer John Swartzwelder would approach the character as though he were a big dog, not completely aware of what was going on around him all the time, but still having an incredible lust for life. The way he saw it, as long as you write Homer like that, you can't go wrong. Homer in this episode is treated somewhat similarly. Where's my burrito? Ow! He's single-minded, oblivious, somewhat selfish, but far from malicious, and a bit of a slow thinker. Dad, I'll trade you this delicious doorstop for your crummy old Danish. Done and done. <laughs> And all of these traits are utilized either to tell great jokes or to progress and escalate the plot. In fact, Homer's defiance of Mr. Burns' new contract is predicated on a joke about Homer's slow-wittedness. A simple joke made at Homer's expense, but one which has been lodged in the heads of countless fans for nearly 30 years. So long, dental plan! Dental plan! Lisa needs braces! Dental plan! Lisa needs braces! Dental plan! Lisa needs braces! Dental I lied a little bit, there are actually several jokes bundled into this. From Homer's slow wit to the absurdity that such a simple pattern of thoughts could be so easily interrupted, to the direct realization of the obvious consequences, to the repetition itself. To quote Buster Keaton, the audience loves the slow thinker. Lisa needs braces! If we give up our dental plan, I'll have to pay for Lisa's braces! This aspect of Homer's character is what ultimately keeps the plot moving. Homer's seeming inability to understand Mr. Burns' negotiating tactics and his constant misinterpretation of them not only leads to more humor, but it convinces Burns that Homer is some sort of expert negotiator playing hardball. Burns escalates to using mob tactics and intimidation in an effort to come out on top, but Homer still just doesn't get the message, finding the negotiations to be exhausting and nothing coming from them, leading the workers to strike. But don't get it twisted. Homer isn't on a moral crusade in this episode. He isn't doing this because he feels it should be the right of everyone at the plant to keep their dental plan. He isn't even doing it so Lisa won't be so miserable with that hideous headgear. These predate stainless steel, so you can't get them wet. 
He's doing it so he doesn't have to pay for her braces. A selfish reason to be sure, and his selfishness is bolstered further by his reaction to being voted Union President. Hey, what did this job pay? Nothing. Don't! Unless you're crooked. Woohoo! It's a clear admission that Homer wouldn't mind being a crooked Union boss if it meant getting paid as a result. But once again, it isn't out of malice, it's out of greed. But he doesn't even become corrupt. The temptation is there, but he just can't see it due to, again, pure incompetence. Wait a minute, is he coming on to me? If I should slip something into your pocket, what's the harm? Oh my god, he is coming on to me. <coughs> Sorry, Mr. Burns, but I don't go in for these backdoor shenanigans. Sure, I'm flattered, maybe even a little curious, but the answer is no. Moreover, his idea of being president of the Union is so simple and somewhat outlandish that it's just funny. He sees it as essentially being like a mafia boss, only instead of taking bribes, he is offered artisan donuts on the streets of a 1930s Italian ghetto. Don Homer, my son, he has a trouble with the... Uh... Eh, 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 eh. Molto bene. That's a nice donut. Yet, despite his selfishness, Homer is an endearing character here, partially because he isn't trying to make a grab for more than what he sets out for, but also because his obliviousness to Mr. Burns' negotiating tactics reduce him from being a self-centered jerk to more of a lovable oaf. Or a dog. A dog who can't find his way to the appropriate area to relieve himself, so he quietly pisses on a rug in a corner of the house where no one will notice for a while. Find the bathroom all right? Uh, yeah. But at the end of the day, the most vital aspect of Last Exit to Springfield isn't the gags or the character interactions, but how expertly it's all woven together in the service of a well-researched plot. I'm not going to pretend that I'm an expert on the history of labor unions in the United States. I'm not going to pretend I know more about Jimmy Hoffa beyond what I could summarize in a sentence or two. But I do have eyes and ears, and I'm keenly aware of the frankly disgusting amount of power held by those hoarding the wealth, both individual people and corporations. The working class in this country has been exploited for decades, centuries even. And with the value of the dollar decreasing and wages stagnating, a not insignificant amount of everyday people find themselves stuck in a state of wage slavery. They may make enough money to scrape by, but not enough to save, prepare for an emergency, or relocate for better employment opportunities, especially when things like health insurance or dental coverage are tied to their employment. And that's to say nothing of skyrocketing rent and housing costs. Take a look at the AAA video game industry to see how these sorts of conditions breed environments where executives and management are able to get away with so much abuse of their workers without any repercussions. Last Exit to Springfield embodies the spirit of the working class. Is it a bit naive in its optimism when held against the backdrop of the world of today? Maybe a bit. But if the recent Kellogg strike teaches us anything, it's that not all hope is yet lost. Is it foolish to believe that such an amoral billionaire would misread one's sheer ineptitude so poorly as to mistake it for exceptional competency? I mean, probably, but it's just so absurd and in some ways cathartic you can't help but laugh. Is it silly to think that one percenters' hearts could grow three sizes and they give in out of the goodness of their hearts? Or that they would cheap out on their union busters? Absolutely, but goddamn if it didn't give us the best rambling old man diatribe in comedy, courtesy of Grandpa Simpson. To take the ferry cost a nickel, and in those days, nickels had pictures of bumblebees on them. I've had this ramble memorized my entire life. But none of that makes the messaging of Last Exit to Springfield any less powerful or meaningful. Just about every aspect of the episode revolving around workers' unions is true to the experience and history of unions, from the disparate tradesmen that formed the union itself, to the Union Strike Folk Song performed by Lisa, written by Jeff Martin. In fact, this song would be adapted for use in actual protests in Argentina in 2017 by employees of the media conglomerate Clarín Group against its CEO, Hector Magneto.
Last Exit to Springfield has a strong legacy within the Simpsons canon and beyond it. Regularly touted in various articles and listicles as one of the best episodes of the show's run, and by some as the best of the entire series. It's also spawned several memes which pervade beyond Simpsons fans to varying degrees, such as Dental Plan, Lisa Needs Braces, Classical Gas, The Blurst of Times, Grandpa's Ramblings, Where's My Burrito, Hired Goons, and Why must you turn my office into a house of lies? Honestly, even beyond what has ascended into memedom, this episode is highly quotable. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if someday you could start typing any line from this episode into Google, and it would correctly autocomplete it like with any given line from Star Wars. Is Last Exit to Springfield the best episode of The Simpsons to me? No, but perfection is an exceptionally high bar, nigh impossible to clear, and as host of Escape from Vault Disney Tony Goldmark said, it's got some pretty stiff competition. But it's certainly one of the funniest and most intelligently written episodes in the series, and as predictable as it sounds, I wouldn't hesitate to say, it's one of my personal favorites. And that's the tooth. <laughs> <laughs> Ha 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 ha!